I think so. Travis, are you good to go? All right, we are live. Great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June 25, 2020 Delta Stewardship Council meeting. Let's start with establishing a quorum. Alphabetical roll call starting with Judge Frank Damrell. Damrell present. Randy here. here. Tatayan here. Oscar yep. yeah, is here. We have a quorum. On to agenda item three, closed session. We anticipate returning from closed session at about 10 a.m. See all of you then. Okay, uh, Travis, go ahead and let us know when, when you're good to go. Right, you are live. Good morning, everyone. We are re reconvening from closed session. I have nothing to report from closed session. So let's reestablish a quorum. Uh, I'll, I'll call each council member's name for the roll call. Judge Frank Damrell. Here. I can't hear. Can you hear me, Judge? Well, I, I see the judge. I see he's here. Um, Randy Fiorini. Present. Maria Moranian. I here. Oscar Viegas. Present. And Susan Tatayan. We have a quorum. Uh, just some housekeeping items before we... Susan, excuse me, I think Daniel's on. Oh, is Daniel on? I don't see him. Hi. Oh, there he is. I am, yeah, I'm here by phone. Hi. My apologies, Daniel. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, now on to the housekeeping items. As a prudent measure to reduce community transmission of COVID-19, we are meeting today remotely, as you can see. We are webcasting the audio and presentations of this meeting online, and a link can be found on the council's website. If any member of the public is interested in providing public comment, please send an email blue card to the council clerk at engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov. Be sure to note your name and the agenda item that you wish to comment on. And please note if you wish to speak on the phone or would like the clerk to read your comment. The council clerk will then provide the link and or call in information for you to join the meeting and provide your comment. Please do this as soon as possible so that there is time to get the meeting information to you. After each agenda item, I will ask the clerk for comments in the order they are received just as we do during in-person council meetings. When your name is called, the meeting host will unmute you. Please note that public comment on any matters not on today's agenda can be provided during agenda item 13. Uh, council members, other quick housekeeping for our meeting today. To mitigate background noise, everyone please mute your line when not speaking. You can do this by clicking the microphone button at the bottom of your screen or by pressing star six on your phone. If you wish to speak or ask a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom by clicking the hand icon in the right hand corner or by pressing star nine if you are on the phone. I will do my best to see and call on you in a timely manner. In addition, AGP and Meeting Services are co-hosting the meeting today on Zoom. They will be assisting with presenting the PowerPoints, making sure you are unmuted, and moving the various presenters into the presentation space when appropriate. 
If you need any assistance, please comment to them in the comment box or text or call 916-798-9817. Thank you for, to everyone for attending this meeting remotely and helping make it a success. On to uh, agenda item six, consent calendar. Council members, this is a, an action item adopting the April 30 meeting summary and the May 1 meeting summary. Madam Chair, I would move the item. I'll uh, second. Viegas, motion, move the item. Brandy Fiorini seconds. Uh, is there any public comment? Okay, let's proceed with the vote, starting with Judge Damrell. Brandon, can the judge hear me? Okay, yeah, I'm alive. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Randy Fiorini. Fiorini, I. Maria Moranian. I saw that she said I, but she's on mute, so. I. <laughs> I <laughs> um, Oscar Villegas. Aye. Daniel Zingali. Zingali, aye. Susan Tatayan, aye. Uh, the most, the item is, is uh, approved. On to the item, agenda item seven, executive officers report. Um, as I hand this off to our executive officer, Jessica Pearson, I wanna mention that the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee meeting com committee will be meeting on July 13 uh, by Zoom. And with that, we'll move on to Jessica. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, it, I wanted to echo what the Chair said about uh, our efforts to combat the spread of COVID-19. Most of our staff continue to work remotely, but as always, are available to assist the public at any time. In addition, our public meeting formats like this one continue to be fully remote, and there are a variety of ways to participate either with or without internet. So to contact staff at the council, you are encouraged to email hello at deltacouncil.ca.gov to be directed to the appropriate staff person to help you. Uh, you can also call 916-798-9817 to reach our public participation office directly. And that's 916-798-9817. Now I'm going to move on to a few more updates and announcements. Uh, earlier this year, the Council hit a significant milestone. Uh, Ten years ago, on April 1st, 2010, the newly formed Council met for the first time to discuss its duties set forth in the Delta Reform Act of 2009 and to chart a path forward to develop the first Delta Plan. So on Monday, I released a blog on our website that highlights the anniversary and the council's accomplishments to date. I encourage our viewers to take a look at that and I'd love any feedback that people have. On the one of the priorities that was directed and shaped by the council um, just last year, in fact, it was the top. Uh, Jessica, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I saw randy raise his hand okay well if if it's okay to interrupt i i wanted to compliment jessica on the blog honoring the 10-year anniversary and highlighting a number of the accomplishments um it was really well done and uh, not only do i echo her encouragement for all of the council members to review it but pass it along i have um I've provided that to a number of the people that I work with um, because I think it, it, it emphasizes what an important role the Stewardship Council plays and, and the accomplishments that have been achieved. It's easy to forget some of the monumental accomplishments, but um, Jessica, really, really, really well done. And I, thank you. 
Thanks for those comments, Vice Chair. Okay, um, I want to talk a, a little bit, touch on the communication strategy and tie that to a presentation that you'll have today on the public participation plan. So one of the priorities that was directed and shaped by the council, and as I mentioned, was the topic of discussion last year during two retreats that we held, uh, is a renewed focus on communication for our agency. As members know, we've recently completed a communication strategy to serve as an overarching guidance document for how we communicate about the council's mission, its role, and its activities to a variety of audiences. So today, we will present for your consideration a very important component of this communication strategy, which is the public participation plan. This is a, a new to our agency plan. We have not had a formal public participation plan before. Um, so we're excited about it. And it's a, it's a really important part of our overarching communication strategy. Next, I'm going to provide a brief update on the ongoing work to develop an ecosystem amendment to the Delta plan. At our last meeting, which was May 1st, the council received an update on the ecosystem amendment to the Delta plan and directed staff to initiate a CEQA process, the California Environmental Quality Act process, using a May 2020 draft as the project description. So on May 11th, the council staff released a notice of preparation for an environmental impact report for this proposed Delta plan ecosystem amendment. And this initiated a 60 day public comment period. I, and we continue, we are in that comment period now. On May 28th, staff then held a meeting on the project to collect public input on the scope of the environmental analysis. And we, we had just under 50 participants involved in that meeting. The public comment period for the notice of preparation is ongoing and concludes at five o'clock PM on July 10th. Comments can be submitted via email to ecosystemamendment at deltacouncil.ca.gov or at any of our other hello or engage email addresses as well. <clears throat> Staff will be working on the environmental impact report throughout the rest of 2020 and likely into early 2021. And we are currently anticipating releasing a draft EIR on the ecosystem amendment for public comment in spring 2021. On to Delta Plan implementation and coordination letters, which are in your packet. We sent five comment letters since the last council meeting, and for the sake of time, I'll only briefly summarize topics and recipients. All letters are available on our website under the council heading and the correspondence subheading in the drop down menu. On May 11th, the council sent a letter to the Central Valley Flood Protection Board regarding the final EIS EIR for phase two of the Sacramento River Bank Protection Project, which consists of a series of levee erosion, <coughs> excuse me, levee erosion repair activities. On June 1st, we sent a letter to the Department of Water Resources regarding their partially recirculated draft EIR for the state water supply contract amendments for water management. The contract amendments seek to provide greater flexibility in water management regarding transfers and exchanges for the state water project. And the letter states that the contract amendments appear to be a covered action and details the Delta plan policies that may apply. Of course, we also encourage DWR to engage staff in early consultation on the project. The remaining three letters are regarding the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission's Valley Rail Sacramento Extension Project, DWR's draft water budget handbook, and a letter to DWR regarding the Eastern San Joaquin Groundwater Authority's Subbasin Groundwater Sustainability Plan, their GSP. So if you have questions regarding any of these five letters or the underlying projects, please feel free to follow up with myself or with our planning deputy, Jeff Henderson. I have two updates regarding covered action certifications since we last met May 1st. First, the Department of Water Resources submitted a certification of consistency for the Sherman Island Belly, Welly, Belly Wetland Restoration Project. I described this a little bit at our last council meeting. 
The public review and appeal period for the project was open from April 7th through Thursday, May 7th, and no appeals were received. Second, the Westlands Water District submitted a certification of consistency for the Lower Yolo Ranch restoration project, and the project was subsequently appealed by the Solano County Water District. This matter was originally set for a council hearing on July 6th. However, the parties have reportedly reached an agreement and Solano County Water District has formally withdrawn its appeal. As a result, the public hearing has been canceled and Westlands Water District can proceed to implement the covered action. I wanna express my appreciation for council staff for their hard work preparing for the hearing while the appeal was still active. I wanna note that the outreach highlights report and the active projects list are available in your packets as a resource. And for this month, we have no legal update. Uh, we also have no oral legislative report, but there is a written legislative report available in your packets for review. And with that, just a quick foreshadowing of what's on the agenda today. Uh, we have two action items and two information items in alternating order. The Delta lead scientist will ask the council to appoint six new members to the Delta Independent Science Board. The Delta Watermaster, Michael George, will be with us to present his regular report. The council will consider endorsement of a final draft of a public participation plan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it includes council public engagement strategies and guidance for how the public can engage in our work. And lastly, representatives from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and UC Davis will present on a collaborative decision-making process for restoration and enhancement of Frank's tract in the Central Delta. And Chair, that concludes my executive officer's report. Happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Jessica. Council members, are there any questions for Jessica? Okay, do we have any public comment? No public comment. Um, I just got an email from, oh, he came, sorry. Mike, I just saw your email, he got locked out. So he's back in. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike, for being here. I'm uh, sorry that you got locked out. We're still... No, it's fine, everything's fine now. Um, oh, good. It, it, the phone was giving me some issues, but I found a way to, uh, to uh, get in via computer, so everything is just fine, thank you. Great. Okay, on to agenda item eight, lead scientist report. Great, uh, good morning, Chair Tatayan and council members. Um, I have a number of items for you this morning. I will try to be brief because I also have the nomination for the Delta Independent Science Board members that Jessica uh, mentioned. So I'll start with a summary of some of the recent events that are in included in the written report. And first, I wanna highlight the discussion series for the science needs assessment workshop. At the council meeting at the end of April, the, the chair of the Delta Independent Science Board, Liz Canuel, mentioned the work that the Independent Science Board has been doing to raise awareness of climate change and the need to prepare our science efforts to provide better insight into how we address rapid environmental change. And as summarized in the written report, the Independent Science Board, the DPIC agencies, the science program have all been working towards a science needs assessment workshop that will now be held in October. And towards that workshop, we've been putting on a four-part discussion series to engage Delta scientists, managers, and decision makers on these topics and to set up the discussion for the workshop. And I, for this, I want to acknowledge Amanda Bull and many other council staff who've put in a lot of effort for the workshop as well as for the discussion series. So two of the discussions have already occurred um, and the next will be taking place at the end of July on July 28th. The first discussion focused on the science behind rapid change, identifying what we already know in terms of current and future impacts of climate change in the Delta. Earlier this month, we had the second discussion to discuss the management questions that Delta decision makers would like to see addressed. This included Paul Souza, the regional director of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Campbell Ingram, the executive officer of the Delta Conservancy, and Jennifer Pierre, the general manager of the state water contractors. This discussion was really, it was 
really valuable with lots of input from online surveys as well as focus presentations from the panelists and uh, some really valuable question and answers to get at these issues of what, what are the management decisions and issues that we really need to think about in terms of climate change. And I also wanna highlight that this discussion was just featured this morning in uh, Maven's notebook. We had, um, there's clearly lots of interest in this. We had close to a hundred participants and actually a growing number of participants from the first to second discussion. So I think it's been really valuable so far. And in July, we will have Luis Conrad, the Deputy Executive Officer of Science here at the Council, Mike Joukowsky, the Science Coordinator of the US Geological Survey Southwest Region, and Stephanie Fong, the, the IEP, the Interagency Ecological Programs Coordinator. And they'll be discussing what current science programs are doing to address these management questions and what we can be doing to improve the efforts in terms of providing better science. And then the last discussion will take place in September and will address governance and funding issues to ensure that we're effectively engaging science. So um, I want to then now move on to the second item that's in your binder. Uh, the last and last month we announced 10 new Delta Science Fellows. This the Science Fellows program is really an outstanding program that the Council and the Science Program supports to um, to provide support for graduate students and postdocs to do research in the Delta. And the program provides really outstanding mentoring opportunities for the fellows. It really is a unique fellowship in that it requires an academic mentor as well as a community mentor to ensure that the research that's done connects with Delta science and management needs and to ensure that the fellows get some really strong guidance throughout their tenure. The, priority, the research topics for the fellows comes out of the science action agenda and the 10 awardees with their work that covers a, all the range of issues in the science action agenda, they're listed in your written report. There's a link to more information about them and their projects and I encourage you to look at that um, to learn more about their proposed work. Uh, in the past, the fellows were, it was for the students, it was only open to PhD students. And this year we opened up the fellowship to master's students and awarded one of the fellows to a, one master's student. And this was done to expand the reach of the program and it opened it up to a broader range of students. Um, I also wanna note that as in the past, California Sea Grant has administered the program for us and has really helped out with recruitment and outreach and been a real great partner in the fellows program. And this year, the state water contractors provided funding to support two of the fellows on their own. And then we are co-funding one student with the water contractor. So their contribution as well has been really valuable to the overall fellows program. Um, and then I also wanna highlight an upcoming event that's included in the rep my written report. Uh, Michael George may include this in his, in his report as well, because this is an event sponsored in large part by the State Water Board. It's the California Water Data, Data Science Symposium that occurs on next Monday and Tuesday. It promotes the um, improved work on data science and data management to inform the water quality decisions that we're making for the state of California. And there's a link there in the written report. And I encourage anyone listening to participate. I know that staff from the council have participated in um, multiple past water data symposia and they've been very productive and informative. So uh, any questions on any of those items before I move on to the article uh, that I wanted to summarize? Okay, so the, the, t this month's article um, has is uh, focusing on mega droughts. It was published recently in Science Magazine that uh, remember is one of the, probably the most, the highest profile um, journal, scientific journal in the country. And um, there's an app, the visual abstract was just posted there on the screen. So you can see, uh, I'll refer to that in talking about a summary of the article. But so this um, again, focuses on um, mega drought issues. And um, they, these, the, the authors for this paper use tree ring data to understand how historic soil moisture conditions have varied over time, going back 1200 years to the year 800. So that's what the graph there shows you soil moisture from the year 800 to, to present. 
And they use that term mega drought, which really doesn't have a specific criteria, but what it refers to is a long-term dry period, 20 years or more, that leads to low soil moisture and stress for plants, stress for plants both in natural ecosystems as well in, in, in an agricultural setting. Um, not it's not necessary that every year in that period be a drought, but these are periods that are chronically dry with infrequent wet years and more frequent dry periods that lead to that soil um, moisture, low soil moisture and stress. So by looking at the tree ring data and then correlating that with current conditions, they uh, developed an index of soil moisture that's shown here. And um, as I said, they looked back over a period going to the year 800. Our mega, current mega drought that started in the year 2000 is the second worst in the last 1,200 years. There have been four longer droughts in that 1,200 year period, but this period is as intense as all but the drought in 1500 that circled there with the yellow point. That was the most intense um, drought in that period. They also highlight in the paper, as is shown in, with the um, pie chart at the top, that um, climate change has increased the intensity of the drought. And they looked at, if we look at the current drought severity, how much of it is due to natural variability, how much of it is due to climate, human-induced uh, anthropogenic cl climate change. They did that with a separate model in evaluating current temperatures um, with and without climate change. And they, they, in their model, they identified that about half of the intensity currently is due to climate change and half due to natural variability. Um, so, and, and they also note that this current drought is, could easily continue as, as identified, there's four historic droughts that have been longer. Um, so the, I think some of the key messages is that with climate change, how it's definitely affected our current mega drought and is also likely to affect and even probably more intensively as climate change grows, will uh, lead to intentional additional extended drought periods into the future. So this really highlights the importance of continued awareness and vigilance for droughts in our region. And I think we all are really aware of that, but we really need to prepare now, both in terms of a management uh, perspective, as well as in preparing our science so that we better understand and better address um, upcoming droughts. The Delta ADAPTS uh, preliminary results that I think you'll be hearing about um, sometime soon highlight the importance of, of these um, events. In addition to climate change causing gradual change, these extreme events like droughts and floods are likely to cause some of the really significant impacts of climate change going forward. And um, the Delta ADAPTS project really highlights that. The Science Needs Assessment Workshop and the work that the Delta Independent Science Board has also highlighted the importance of these um, particular events like droughts. And it's also an uh, important part of the, uh, the ongoing amendment to the ecosystem chapter. So I think we're all aware of it, but we really need to think about how we can um, continue to prepare and always be ready for upcoming droughts. So any questions on, on that paper? John? <clears throat> uh, yes. We have a um, the, the, the human induced climate change is, is decidedly increasing and increasing. And uh, I presume back in the year 1200, there was no such uh, uh, drivers from the standpoint of anthropogenic uh, conduct of, you know, they didn't have the, 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 the factors that we have now. Uh, is there any way to predict, uh, you know, how long this drought will last? Is there some thought given to the fact that uh, given the uh, human-induced climate change, uh, we're, we're in a new, it's a new new frontier. I mean, this is a lot different than the last 1,200 years. So it, it isn't possible to predict exact, you know, to exactly how, it, how long it might occur, but based on, you can see the width of some of those red bars. So those, the width of those red bars indicate the extent of how long those drought periods lasted, the, the four really significant drought periods over that 1200 year period. And you can see that some are, three of them are significantly wider than the current drought. 
almost double the current drought. So in the past, we have had those. And, and as you highlight, that was without climate change. So it's not at all out of the realm of possibility that we might have an extended drought period. As I said, it's not every year being a drought, but an extended dry period that could last multiple decades. They have lasted in the past multiple decades without climate change. So clearly ours could easily last um, you know, twice as long as this drought not to say that this one will, but we are. But I think we're likely to have them more frequently and and more more severely, more frequently, and longer lasting into the future. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so then I also just want to finish up by highlighting that this does connect to this year's the by the numbers report for this month. Um, and we are at about 30 to 40% of annual rainfall um, for this year. We still have relatively high levels in the reservoirs because of pre last year being a very wet year. But uh, again, I think we really need to think about how we, how we manage that water going forward into the future. And I encourage you to look at that uh, by the numbers report. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Madam Chair. Yes, Oscar, go ahead. Just a quick question, John. Thank you very much for, for uh, sharing this with us. I, I, uh, I'd asked you uh, earlier in the year, uh, as part of one of the news clips, uh, a reference to, I believe it was the University of Arizona, talked about the tree ring research and the data that showed the prospects of and the historical nature of um, these extended droughts. And I just wondered, in light of what you just presented, uh, absent saying, you know, the sky is falling and it's, you know, the next mega drought is, is imminent. Should there be some way in which we um, ask the question of ourselves as we contemplate a, a range of different policy issues, given the nature of climate change and our management approach and the science and the extended periods of potential drought? How, you know, as we as we contemplate our work, should there be a question asked um, uh, at the end of the day, how, how do we address, is there a path forward in light of, or what alternative are we considering in light of the fact that, you know, there, there are these potential mega drought scenarios um, that we have to at least think about? And so I wondered, and maybe you don't have an answer now, but I just, it seems to me that we ought to be thinking about, you know, how we ask that question of ourselves as we contemplate all of our work to say, what if, right? So what if, and should we be considering, um, you know, alternative paths or what should we be encouraging something different than what we normally do, right? Because our, uh, our, 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 uh, our thinking has to change in the event that there was something like this. So, um, but I, it's a, it's a question, more of a statement, a bit rhetorical, but I, I, I share that with you because I wanted to thank you, first first of all, for bringing it forward, but also I think it's something we should be thinking about as we, as we go forward. Again, thank you, Oscar. I, so I, I agree completely with, with what you highlighted, and I think um, it, it is not to say that we aren't aware of these things. The, the reason we have higher water levels in, in the reservoirs currently is because we are very much aware of this, and people are thinking about how do we manage water over the longer term. But I think th this work and the other work, the work from Arizona highlighting the perfect droughts across different watersheds highlights that we really need to put even more emphasis on this and really think um, think longer term and, and prepare for what, what in the past we may have thought as being very rare, unusual events that are likely to become much more frequent and and regular events into the future so i don't i think um it as you say it's really sort of a, a call to to increased awareness of this and to really more um more intensively focusing in on how we can address these issues going forward thank you john sure thank you for the question if there's no other questions, that finishes up my report. Council members, any other questions? Uh, Lita, is there any public comment on this item? 
There's no public comment. Okay. Well, in that case, let's move on to agenda item nine, appointments of members to the Delta Independent Science Board. Dr. John Calloway. Great, uh, thank you. So I do have the, those slides up, great. So um, thank you again, Chair Tatayan. Uh, it really is a privilege and an honor to present the nominations for the Delta Independent Science Board to you. I think, you know, given the really critical role that the Independent Science Board plays in providing oversight and review of science in the Delta for the Council and beyond, one of the most important duties in my role as lead scientist is to nominate council, uh, candidates for the Independent Science Board to the Council. And in this case, it's not just one nominee, but six of the 10 members of the Independent Science Board that are up for your consideration. So this morning, I wanna give you a brief overview of the Delta Independent Science Board, as well as the process that we use to recruit and evaluate candidates, and then introduce the proposed nominees to you for your consideration. So the next slide. The Independent Science Board was created through the Delta Reform Act. And as is indicated um, on the slide from, with the text from the Reform Act, it's required that independent science board members be national or internationally prominent scientists that have expertise that will provide insight on the wide range of issues that we uh, face in the Delta. And as you'll see with the nominees, I don't think we have any problem in reaching this bar of prominent science, scientists with the current group of nominees. So next slide. The role of the Independent Science Board as outlined in the Delta Reform Act is to provide oversight of the scientific research, monitoring and assessment programs that support adaptive management in the Delta through periodic reviews of each of those programs. And as an independent group with a mix of local and outside experts across a range of disciplines, they are able to provide extremely valuable insight and critique on how science is being used and can be used in the Delta. And it is important to note that the Independent Science Board provides two general types of reviews. They provide requested reviews that come from the council, from the science program, from other state and federal agencies, including the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Resources Control Board. These are requests for review of documents related to California to the California water fix. Um, they provided a, enormous input on the development of the original Delta plan. Most recently, um, they provided input for the development of the science behind the ecosystem amendment to the Delta plan, including recommendations on the three synthesis documents that staff prepared to set up the science behind the amendment. They've also provided valuable reviews of the Delta Science Plan and the Science Action Agenda. And above and beyond these requested reviews, the majority of the Independent Science Board work and their time is spent on broader reviews of the science programs in the Delta. They refer to these as their thematic reviews because they focus their reviews of Delta Science around the key themes that are outlined in the chapters of the Delta Plan from water flow to water quality, ecosystems, revy, uh, risk and levy issues, and the Delta as an evolving place. Over the last 10 years, they've done many thematic reviews around different aspects of the science for each of these different topics. And Liz Canuel gave you an overview of their work at the April meeting, including ongoing work on the monitoring enterprise in the Delta, as well as a completed review of the um, interagency ecological program. So on this slide, I've just highlighted a few of their more influential reviews. They did a, a review and a journal article on adaptive management that highlighted many of the key concepts of adaptive management and really has become a foundational paper on this topic, not just here in the Delta, but even beyond. Their review on the Delta as an evolving place raised awareness of considering human dimensions and social science issues in the Delta. And their work was really instrumental in motivating the in initiation of the social science task force and the new joint positions, position that we are currently in the midst of searching for, for a Sea Grant extension specialist. 
And last, their memo to DPIC in February 2019 led to the Science Needs Assessment Workshop that I just mentioned, and I think also will be really a foundational effort for incorporating rapid change into science and management in the Delta. So next slide. We are at a, at a really critical transition for the Delta Independent Science Board. The board includes 10 members that's as that was established in the Reform Act. And the focus of the membership has been to cover the broad range of issues that the Delta confronts and that are highlighted there on the slide. We have so many openings on the board currently because five of the 10 members have served since the board was established in 2010 and they're reaching their 10 year uh, maximum limit. And really this is a very good sign. The board members that have served their full two, two terms, they've done this because they're interested to contribute to the system and they see the importance and value of the independent review of science. And in addition to those five members who are termed out completely, Joy Zedler uh, recently stepped down after serving one five-year term. And I, I did not include a slide with all of the current board members, but I do want to acknowledge their enormous contribution. Uh, in addition to Joy's uh, leaving the board, we will, uh, the members that are finishing out their term in August are Liz Canuel, the current chair, Tracy Collier, who works on um, water quality and toxicity issues, Dick Norgard, who's a social scientist and economist who has given input on a wide range of social and science issues, Vince Resch, who's really given a lot of input on some of the monitoring issues that he's an expert on, and John Weens, who's a landscape ecologist, um, and provided that broader, large-scale spatial perspective. If you're able to sit in on the August Delta Independent Science Board meeting, that will be August 13th and 14th. On the 14th, they plan to provide, the, the outgoing members pr will provide some thoughts on their participation on the board and lessons, insights that they have. I think it will really be a valuable discussion and I would encourage you if you have the opportunity to, to watch that because I think we really can't thank them enough for their contribution. And then also the continuing members are the, on the board are Steve Brandt, who will be the chair elect, Jay Lund, who um, is the, will become the past chair, Tom Holzer and Joe Fernando. So that said, I wanna move on to the recruitment of the new members that is up for your consideration. So the next slide. So in terms of the recruitment, it really has been an extensive process. It started over a year ago when we first started developing the request for applications that was put together by the selection panel for this search that is really the last bullet there. And I really do want to acknowledge really deep gratitude to the science program and USGS staff who were on the selection panel, put in an enormous effort in developing the recruitment, reviewing applications, and providing enormous insight to guide my recommendation for the nominations. And that the, the staff members were Luis Conrad, Lauren Hastings, Karen Kafitz, Edmund Yu, and Yumiko Henneberry from the science program, and Mike Chakowsky and Anka Mueller Solger from the US Geological Survey. So we did very broad outreach across many organizations and avenues to ensure the diversity of candidates. Diversity issues are certainly front and center for all of us currently. And I can say um, that from the first meeting of our selection panel, this was a really important topic for us. We thought about diversity in a variety of ways in terms of expertise and perspective, gender, age or stage in, in uh, the candidate's career and race and ethnicity issues for underrepresented groups. I would say in terms of the first three, we were very successful. We expanded the social science perspectives on the board from one to two, still small, but we doubled them. Uh, and more importantly, all the candidates, the new candidates um, have really broad perspectives in their science. They're not narrowly focused academics at all, but scientists who want to engage on difficult issues and um, are very interested in providing insight from science to applied management questions. And they are all very open and interested in engaging across disciplines. And they see this interdisciplinary issue or approach as really essential to the kinds of challenges that we confront currently. In terms of both gender and age diversity, we expanded the board. Four of the six nominees that I'm presenting are women. 
And this is especially important since we're losing the two current women on the board, Liz Kianuel and Joyce Edler. And we have a mix of career stages in the nominees. I think it's really valuable and important to have some older members and bring a lot of wisdom from their long career, but it's just as important to have some insight from some younger members and who are engaged on many of the new ideas in the sciences. So, and as I mentioned, they all, regardless of that, they all are truly standouts as you'll see and, and as you can see in the biographies that are included in the written materials. We did not do so well in terms of bringing underrepresented groups to the board. This really is the, a, an enormous challenge um, the pool of underrepresented groups in the sciences in general is very small and something that has been the focus of a lot of discussion over time and especially recently. It's true across all the sciences and is even more accentuated at higher levels or mid-career levels um, within the sciences and also um, probably more accentuated in the environmental sciences than in other areas. So as noted in the summary report, we did do targeted outreach to professional groups and to individuals to bring in more diverse candidates. But I, as I said, we really were not successful. And I think this is something we really need to keep working on. We've had some really valuable discussions around this issue recently within the council, the science program, and with our partners at Sea Grant about our review panels where we have similar challenges. I can assure you there's really strong commitment towards moving this forward. It's not something that is gonna drop off our radar. So, um, as indicated there on the second bullet, we had 40 applications for these six positions. I think I contacted close to 130 uh, potential applicants, encouraging them to consider the board. We had a very rigorous and very competitive selection process. I can say it was a very difficult decision to get down to the six nominees that we, are, we settled on, given the exceptional pool of candidates. Many that were not chosen were extremely well qualified and I hope that they will be interested to apply for future openings. I can say the calls and emails to those finalists who were not chosen were some really difficult uh, as they were really some standouts that we were not able to bring onto the board. I think that as well is a very good sign for the board and for the council that we are attracting such outstanding candidates for the board. So uh, from those 40 applicants, we interviewed 18 candidates. I spoke to close to 60 references for those candidates. And um, as I mentioned, the contributions of the staff really was uh, essential in this recruitment and review. So the next slide. So I wanna present briefly the six nominees. They are truly exceptional scientists. It was a humbling experience. To, um, to see how distinguished these um, nominees and even some that weren't nominated really are. So they all have outstanding academic cred credentials um, and they've served on a wide range of prestigious national and international panels and engaged on similar management issues and systems from across the country and world. Um, so they do come from a broad range of expertise. I'll just give you a brief introduction to each of them and I encourage you to review their biographies and their more complete um, CVs that are included in the written materials. So Jim Clern is the most local candidate. He is an exceptionally well-respected scientist from the US Geological Survey who has expertise on ecological and water quality, biogeochemistry issues in the San Francisco Bay and the Delta. He's done work on phytoplankton, food webs, restoration and climate change. He just recently retired from the Geological Survey and is truly an extremely distinguished uh, scientist with some exceptional awards and um, recognition for his work. Virginia Dale is recently retired from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and is now an adjunct faculty member at the University of Tennessee. She is an internationally recognized expert on landscape issues. As highlighted in her biography, her work has focused on environmental decision making. She's worked on issues of agriculture, energy, and ecosystems, something that will be really valuable for the board uh, given those issues here in the Delta. Through her work, she has also focused on the need for broad stakeholder engagement in decision making. She served a major role on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
that received the 2007 uh, Nobel Prize Award along with Al Gore for their work on climate change issues across the globe. Uh, third is Tanya Heikola. She is a faculty member and associate dean in the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver. Her expertise is in the field of environmental policy and governance, issues that have received lots of attention here in the Delta. More specifically, her research has focused on how governance can facilitate collaboration and how it can foster learning really linked to the concept of adaptive management that is so central for us. She has worked on water and restoration issues in the West throughout her career, including an early review of different approaches to governance that included the Delta, the Pacific Northwest, as well as other systems like the Everglades and more. She provided input to the social science task force during their review and is very much aware of some of the social science challenges here um, in the Delta. Um, and then next up is Diane McBride. She is a faculty member at the University of Colorado Boulder and also has significant experience prior to that with the US Geological Survey. Her work focuses on the connection of hydrology, water quality, and aquatic ecosystems. She's worked on rivers and lakes around the world from Colorado to the Arctic and the Antarctic, as well as in Africa. She is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, one of the highest levels of recognition in the science and engineering community. In addition to being a member of the National Academy, she has served on their review panels, something that it's extremely prestigious. Just to serve on one of them is really amazing. She has served on 14 panels for the National uh, Academy of Sciences, which is more than anyone I've, I've ever seen in my life. Um, Robert Nyman is, a recently is recently retired from the University of Washington, the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. He's worked on both fish and plant ecology issues and river systems around the world with really extensive experience with salmon in the Pacific Northwest. I know his work from the books that he's done um, uh, using them in classes on restoration and wetland ecology. As with other nominees, he has served on numerous panels nationally and internationally. Most recently, uh, he um, spent a lot of time giving input on issues for the Columbia River and the Pacific Northwest. He just completed a term on their scientific advisory board. He's also been an advisor to the UN um, through uh, their UNESCO program. And then uh, last is Lisa Wanger. She's the second social scientist in the group. Her training is in ecological economics. She's at the University of Maryland, where she um, works on issues in the Chesapeake Bay. She truly spans the disciplines as she's done work at the intersection of natural sciences and social sciences, working on issues related to fertilizer and nutrient issues in the Chesapeake, as well as economic evaluation of restoration projects. She's also worked on invasive species and fisheries issues there in the Chesapeake. So all issues that are really relevant to us. She has also served on the science and technical advisory board in the Chesapeake Bay and was the chair of that group from 2015 to 2017. So as you can see, it truly is an impressive group. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any of the questions you might have about the Independent Science Board in general, the search process, or the nominees. Madam Chair? Yes, Oscar, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. And I, I also had a chance to, to read uh, the, the, um, the backgrounds that you provided, and you're absolutely right. These are very impressive uh, nominees that you've brought forward and I'm very excited about the prospects of what they bring to the table. I just wanted, I have a question and then a statement. Um, my question, I guess I just wanted to confirm that and I think you said that the, uh, amongst many of the roles and responsibilities that the Independent Science Board has, one, of, one will be going forward to review and provide input on uh, any and all conveyance proposals that come before this agency, right? I know that's, that's one that I've checked in on before, but I, I just wanted to confirm that that's still the case and that has not changed. So yes, they, one of their roles was to provide input on BDCP as well as California Water Fix. And I think they actually at their meeting in August, they will get an update from DWR on the, the new Delta conveyance project. And I, okay. I'm, I'm quite certain that they will be interested to provide input on, on that project. 
Perfect. Thank you. And also, I, I, I wanted to thank you for your efforts, and I noted here as well in your um, in your staff work the, the the recruitment, the targeted outreach and recruitment efforts that you uh, have um, undertaken to create and ensure that there is uh, the appropriate um, uh, attempt to ensure the aspects of diverse a diverse pool of candidates are being considered. And I know you did that. Um, and you don't have to respond to this necessarily. I know the efforts did not produce what you were hoping for, but I, I want to underscore the importance of um, uh, continuing to, despite this effort at this round, continuing to uh, think about non-traditional ways in which we recruit, because um, it's, it's a challenge in many respects. Uh, you know, I, I, have, I have several hats I wear, and as we try to diversify and ensure that there is uh, a good um, diversity in our in our applicant pool and in our candidates, um, it, in some sectors it is more challenging than others. And so I, I would just underscore the importance of uh, focusing our efforts in a more targeted way in some in some cases. And I would leave this up to you, but I know that in our recruitment efforts, um, marketing or advertising the positions that we are recruiting for oftentimes don't elicit responses because in many cases uh, the applicants don't see themselves necessarily fitting the profile that we have identified. I mean, the standards that are placed in these recruitment efforts, um, you know, they're, 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 that's a high bar. There's a very high bar. And so I would, I would uh, offer the idea to consider it going forward to be more targeted in the recruitment efforts, to actually going after people to encourage them to apply to be considered for a nomination in some of these positions. And this doesn't go for you, but I just, I wanna continue, I, I, I bring this up because this conversation has, has occurred over and over in many respects. And I know you've done an amazing job of, of ensuring that folks are, are welcome to the application process, but I think it's important that we um, continue to, continue our efforts and try maybe non-traditional ways of, of recruiting in the event that we're not successful time and time again. So you don't, you don't have to respond unless you want to, but I just, I noted, and thank you for putting in here the organizations that you did reach out to, to try and elicit, elicit some applications. And unfortunately you were not successful um, at this, this venture. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Oscar. I really appreciate your comments. And I, I do, I, I agree with you completely that we need, we need to keep trying a mix of approaches, I think, and we need to do it at all levels at this for the science board, for our science review panels, for the fellows. So actually we had some really valuable discussion with Sea Grant just a, a week ago about this issue and recruiting fellows where even there, it's also a, a real challenge. Um, and I, I mean, so I agree. I think we do need to be creative and really continue to push on this. And um, we, we did do some targeted outreach as well, but even that was was not um, successful. But so I, I very much appreciate your comments. Yeah, thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. This is Maria Moronian. May I? Pl I please please go Maria. ahead. Go ahead, Maria. Yes, I just, uh, you know, first, again, I wanted to, to appreciate, like, the effort. I understand how hard it could be. And the fact that you are also looking for new disciplines in the light of all the new development that is happening. And maybe you're looking for people with a certain edge that previous staff might not have had or previous people might not. And that even makes it more, it's harder just because these people are not diamond dozen and they're not sitting around. And the good ones probably all already are somewhere and don't want to move. I mean, I understand that. And so uh, I just wanted to see if, you know, the, in the process, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very sure that you, um, it was a big, big challenge of, of how you find and pick and choose and how do you give yourself, you know, um, a diversity of, of groups that, of, or people that you can choose from. Uh, could you share some of this, like, did you go to a certain kind of sources? Did you go to, did you have to do a certain kind of search that is not the same when let's say, you know, we're looking for, for, for a civil engineer, you know, generally. So could you share a little bit so that we understand and we have some kind of a view into the process that, that you had? Yeah, so we, um, we kept the search 
open quite broadly in terms of expertise so that we would get, so that that wasn't really so limiting. And, and we, you know, as long as they, applicants could show a relevance in terms of their discipline to, to the Delta. And then we advertised widely, both in, in traditional um, avenues where we would reach out to science uh, and engineering, social science experts. And we also targeted particular groups, as is indicated in the, um, in the write-up, the Black Engineering Society, the Chicano and, and Native American um, scientist community. So we, we did some outreach there. And then we did a lot of outreach through our, our network and our extended network of um, the independent science board members, the, the former lead scientists, other, other, um, other collaborators within the, within the system who could identify potential experts, being very mindful and always asking them to help us grow the diversity of candidates in a variety of, of ways and, exactly. and um, got, you know, some, you know, that's where we did some targeted outreach. But as you highlight, Maria, m many of the really out, well, I, I think all of the outstanding um, people in the field from diverse areas are being asked to do service in every different way. And so, um, like I have a colleague at USF um, who she gets asked to serve on panels in, so many different ways. And so I think that really is a challenge as well as um, not burdening those that, that, that community um, of uh, the, the, the small but really valuable community of experts that are out there in those fields. Got it. And then, um, yeah, and, and yes, when I said, I, I meant diversity in, in many senses, also the discipline, you know, the diversity of the disciplines that you need as a result of the new, the new development, the drought, you know, climate change, all that. And then on an average basis, how many would you get for each position? I mean, what was your choices? How many did you have average? I know some were more, some were less. Well, so we looked at it really, um, we didn't look at it as six individual slots with people competing for individual slots. It was really more looking at the pool and then thinking about what would be the ideal mix of expertise for the for the finalists, especially considering the current uh, the, the continuing members. Um, like so, we have we have two engineers who are continuing on the board. So we that wasn't as high a priority. The priorities were really around social science areas, water quality areas, and and. Um, ecological areas where those are the areas where we're losing the, the greatest expertise and where we also want to grow some additional expertise mm -hmm. on the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all the work you did. I know it's hard. Thank you. Well, council members, if there are no other questions for John, this is an action item. Uh, staff is asking us to approve appointment of the nominees to the Delta Independent Science Board. Move the appointment to the Science Board. Motion by Judge Frank Damrell. Second. Second by Maria Miranian. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? No public comment. Great. Thank you, Lita. Welcome. And let's proceed with the vote, starting with Judge Damrell. Uh, Darrell, aye. Randy Fiorini. Fiorini, aye. Maria, oh, well, Mike Gatto. I, do I see Mike is on? Gatto, aye. Okay, thank you, Mike. Maria Moranian. Moranian, aye. Oscar Viegas. Viegas, aye. And Tatayan, aye. The nominees are approved for appointment to the Delta Independent Science Board. Thank you so much, John, for all your hard work over a very long time uh, getting us to this point. Thank you all for your for the vote. I, I really appreciate the enthusiastic support of the board met the new board members, and I know they will be very excited to to serve. So uh, I thank you. Thanks, John. 
Okay, on to agenda item 10, Delta Watermaster update. Mr. Michael George. He's moving over, should be here in a second. Good morning, Michael. There he is. One second, Susan, he's, he's locked in. Oh. He's there now, and then I'm making sure he's unmuted. Oh, Good morning, go. Michael. There you are. Good morning. Um, uh, so everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, so first of all, I want to thank the council for the opportunity to give the uh, quarterly report and uh, also to uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to put on a tie and get out of my pajamas. Um, I know that uh, we've got a number of things to uh, go over and that uh, we're trying to move the meeting along. So um, if you'd advance the slides. Uh, overall, what I wanna talk about is what we've done in the Office of the Delta Watermaster in terms of pandem pandemic response to continue our, our efforts. Uh, secondly, to talk about where we are in the litigation phase having to do with what's going on in uh, uh, the Delta. Um, most of what I want to talk about is to update the council on our current work plan. Uh, as the council members uh, recognize, uh, we were scheduled to give uh, this report in March for the uh, at the meeting that was uh, canceled. So we're happy to bring you up to date and luckily we've got more to report. And finally, I want to discuss uh, a little bit about what we're doing in terms of coordination with others. Next slide, please. So on the pandemic response, in addition to uh, having uh, only rare opportunities to put on a tie or iron a shirt for that matter, um, the good news is that we have been able generally to maintain our essential functions um, through uh, uh, teleworking and other uh, technologies uh, that that we've uh, worked through and uh, through which we coordinate with the other entities and agencies uh, with whom we carry on uh, shared work. Um, in the spring and, and summer, uh, one of the big things that we focus on is the annual water use reports. So on April 1st, the reports of licensees, those who have licenses, report on an annual basis of their water use under license. And then uh, on July 1st, so uh, uh, next, we'll have the statements, uh, supplemental statements of water and diversion of water diversion and use, which uh, are uh, for riparian rights and pre-14 rights. And uh, we're, we've gotten a very good track record. In fact, uh, even though we were uh, hunkered down, COVID-19 and so forth, uh, we actually got a higher, quicker rate of return on the reports of licensees. We're now uh, uh, at roughly, uh, well, we've only got four more reports of licensees that are outstanding and we're working with each of the reporters on those. There are specific reasons for those. So we'll have 100% uh, reports in. In that case, I would, I would contrast it statewide. The Delta's uh, record of uh, performance in terms of getting these reports in on time is actually higher than in the rest of the state. The one thing that we have had to do is to suspend our uh, physical inspections. The last physical inspection we had was on uh, March 11th, just before we went into lockdown. But the, the general news is that we have been able to maintain uh, our momentum in most of our efforts. Next slide, please. So over uh, recent periods, litigation really has taken uh, center stage. One piece of that good news, congratulate the council on the third district court of appeals decision, which essentially vindicated the enforceable framework for coordinating government action through the Delta plan. 
And while I know that there's a, a pending uh, a petition for review, uh, the third district decision was really uh, a quite remarkable and quite uh, valuable uh, uh, vindication of the Delta plan. And it certainly underscored to the state board and to other uh, uh, participating agencies that the Delta plan is the room where it happens. So I think that's a really good thing in terms of focusing uh, attention of the various uh, state and cooperating federal agencies. As always, however, uh, you get decisions on one thing. There are new challenges out there uh, from the state board's perspective. One of the biggest uh, issues is the large number of now consolidated cases challenging the first phase of the board's uh, water quality control plan, that part for the lower San Joaquin River and the Southern Delta water quality objectives. Uh, all of those challenges have been consolidated. And right now we're still in an early stage where we're trying to finalize the uh, record that will go up to the court for review. Um, I, there's been a lot of back and forth among the uh, litigants there, um, but it's a very extensive record. In fact, the index to the record that will go up for review just for this phase one, the index is 900 pages. So it's a gargantuan uh, record uh, that you know uh, in, it includes uh, items that have been developed over a long period of time of that development. Um, moving on from that, obviously we've got new federal biological opinions. There again, the challenges to the federal biological opinions have been consolidated in the federal court for the Eastern District of California sitting in Fresno. Most important development there obviously is the granting by uh, the federal judge of a uh, uh, preliminary injunction, uh, basically uh, deferring uh, the impact of some of the uh, differences in the new biological opinions compared to the old ones. Um, most important aspect of that is the federal judge's indication that it was likely that the primary challenges to the federal biops would be, were in his view, based on the pleadings, likely to ultimately be vindicated. So that's an important uh, uh, waypoint in the road. And then uh, the incidental take permits uh, uh, permit which was promulgated by Department of Fish and Wildlife at the end of March, again, has drawn some uh, challenges. That's at an earlier stage of litigation, but the litigation has sucked a lot of the air out of the room. Not all of it, however. Uh, so let me go to the next slide and say that while these litigations continue, while the Titans exchange thunderbolts above our head, we are trying to proceed with work kind of beneath the litigation uh, level. So the draft resilience portfolio that was uh, uh, published in early February uh, is moving toward uh, a final resilience portfolio. The voluntary agreement framework, I think was a really important uh, waypoint in the process of trying to get all the people who uh, are involved in uh, uh, that process to look at uh, a firm kind of set of goalposts. The state family came together and said, if, if the voluntary agreement parties could come together within this framework, then the secretaries of uh, uh, the natural resources and uh, Cal EPA could recommend uh, agreements within that framework for consideration by the state board in terms of adopting it as an alternative to uh, or, or as the way of the mechanism for implementing uh, Delta Water Quality Control Plan. Again, because the litigation is ongoing, there hasn't been a lot more uh, agreement negotiation, but within that framework, there's been a lot of good work done in terms of model development and analysis of the various uh, proposals that are on the table. 
Obviously, the Delta plan revisions are ongoing, notwithstanding litigation. The advances in Delta science and particularly uh, some of the things that we've been able to do with um, uh, advancing the Delta science program and uh, the data science symposium that John mentioned in his report. So a lot of good stuff going on with respect to uh, advancing Delta science. So when we get back to uh, managing water quality in the Delta, we'll have a better set of tools to work with. Uh, that has also helped to uh, catalyze the emergence of in-Delta multi-benefit projects because the voluntary agreements are primarily focused on the tributaries to the main stem of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River, but uh, we're now seeing the emergence of some multi-benefit projects in the Delta, which are having the opportunity to uh, develop and get uh, some sponsorship and some local uh, support. So that's happening while the litigation is going on. Uh, conveyance project planning, design, and stakeholder engagement um, has been mentioned by Oscar and others already this morning, so I won't go into that. Um, we are continuing within the state board to develop a uh, water quality control plan and the other part, uh, that is the Sacramento uh, main stem and the Delta itself. Uh, so staff work is going on on that. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, this implementation of Sigma, now, of course, in the Delta, we don't have much groundwater usage. However, with the implementation of Sigma elsewhere, the pressure on the Delta as a source of surface water to make up for uh, some of the reductions uh, that we're seeing primarily or particularly in the uh, San Joaquin uh, watershed uh, are important. So that's the kind of stuff that's going on, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of the focus is on the, uh, the big ticket litigation. Let's go to the next slide. And that really underscores the fact that budget uncertainty overhangs everything. I don't need to say any more about that, uh, but what the, what's gonna be available, for instance, in the resilience portfolio, there was a whole bunch of things that the state could do to advance uh, our long-term action on water. Much of that was focused on the Delta. Um, in the uh, 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 draft, it was stated that, well, what happens here is gonna depend a lot on budget priorities and other priorities. So obviously there's a great deal of uncertainty that's working out. So let's go now to the work plan, next slide. Uh, in the in the uh, Delta, we talked uh, in the in past meetings with you about what we're doing to prepare for the next drought, about what we're doing in terms of using the Holland Tract as a pilot project to get at a lot of issues, where we are with outreach and education among diverters, um, what we're doing to implement SB 88, which was a trailer bill to in uh, require measurement throughout the Delta. Um, some heritage enforcement actions in the Delta that we're trying to clean out. How we're now responding to the Tanaka decision, which came down in uh, early April, and where we've gotten in one of our initiatives in terms of administration of uh, Term 91. So I'll go briefly into each of these. Next slide, please. So what we're doing in terms of the next drought, you know, John talked long term about these mega droughts. Uh, this is a, a graphic that shows where we are basically today. Uh, this was released on uh, June 11th. So this is the most recent California drought monitor. And what it shows is what we've learned through what we think of as the rainy season. We got a pretty healthy, uh, in fact, above average rainy season in Southern California. Unfortunately, there's not as much storage capacity in Southern California, but we did get some relief because we didn't get as much demand for um, uh, Delta Reliance from Southern California because of the wet winter we had. But as you can see in the main watersheds where we have uh, our primary uh, storage and transfer facilities, it's been a dry year and things are drying out. So we're trying to apply the lessons we learned from the last drought 
and assuming that this is the first year of a multi-year drought uh, that we got some respite from in 2017 and 2019, which were very wet years. Um, what are we doing to learn those lessons and to assume that we're going to have uh, a more drought uh, management responsibilities going forward is to improve our data uh, cycle. So uh, John also uh, mentioned again the, uh, the Delta Science Symposium, which is next week. This is one of the things you'll see in that symposium. There are a lot of lightning rounds that will discuss and describe um, what's going on in uh, data management and improving our data by cross-referencing it, referencing it. So when we learn something new in a report, how do we relate it? How do we put it in uh, context? Um, and we're looking very hard at what we can do to streamline our regulatory process and make it more responsive to water managers out there and so that we can coordinate much better among Delta Water users. Next slide, please. Uh, the next uh, initiative we talked about is this Holland Track project. We're using the Holland Track as one of the areas to really focus on, drill down on data management, on what we know, how we can clean up the data and really understand more of the information that's in our files related to what's actually going on in the landscape. So this slide just shows you, reminds you of where the Holland Tract is. It's in Contra Costa County, which is important because it's not in the North Delta Water Agency, the Central Delta Water Agency, or the South Delta Water Agency, where we have cooperative uh, operations going together. Um, so this is uh, separate. It's something we could look at kind of on a standalone basis. Next slide, please. And one of the things that recommends Holland Tract as a pilot is that it is, it is well studied, uh, because it's one of the four islands that the Metropolitan Water District purchased from an independent uh, uh, entity, the Delta Wetlands, uh, back in 2016. So there's a lot of information. Metropolitan is a very good partner on this stuff, sharing information, helping us to learn and uh, being quite active in this pilot project. You'll also see from the graphic here that about a quarter of the island is in private ownership. So Met owns about three quarters of the island, but there are inholdings. I mentioned before that our last uh, physical inspection was on March 11th. It was actually that um, what's called on this slide, the, Mac the McDonnell Duck Club. That's a private inholding on the island. It's the one independent of Met. It's the one non-Met claimant of a uh, uh, independent water right. So we're digging uh, deep, going all the way to the bottom of the rat rabbit hole with all the partners here and doing it so that we can apply lessons learned more broadly in the Delta. So let's go to the next slide in which we're really uh, focused on what we're doing to reach out to those we're asking to provide information to us. So the water users in the Delta are providing information on a regular basis. So we've listened to them and, and working with our partners in the, Delta, in the data management unit, part of the Division of Water Rights, we've really upgraded the report management system. We've created better, uh, more intuitive documents so that it's easier for our reporters to enter the document and to have it make sense. And by doing that, we've also improved our ability to cross-reference the new information that comes in from these reports with other available data, data sets. And again, going back to the uh, data science symposium, uh, there are many uh, reports that uh, you'll be hearing about next Monday and Tuesday where that cross-referencing, machine learning, scraping data from one source, comparing it to new data from another source. That has led us to the third bullet point on this slide, to looking at one of the continuing problems which is duplicate reporting. That is where a licensee uh, reports water use, let's say on an island like Holland Track, when they're due statutorily on April 1st. And then the holders of uh, senior claims, riparian or pre-14 claims, report on a different 
statutorily required date, which is July 1st. And by the way, we would like to propose a legislative uh, response, which would be to move all of the reporting to a single date. Uh, we're moving, uh, we're, we're proposing to move forward on that, but this year with COVID-19 and the reduction of the uh, legislature's agenda, we haven't uh, put that forward, but we plan to do it in the next cycle because by having those reporting dates at different times, we've found that we get this duplicate reporting where the same molecules of water diverted often through the same point of diversion and used for the same purpose on the same place of use is reported twice. So when we aggregate the data, we actually do two things. We overestimate the amount of water that's actually used in the Delta. And number two, we mask the portion of that water use, which is at the most senior level in our priority system. Uh, the fourth bullet point here is that we're rolling out and applying more broadly the principles that we enunciated and published in 2017 in our overlap memo, so that we're trying to help users reduce the errors in their reports, reduce the inaccuracies, so that we rely more heavily or more confidently on the reports that we get. And then in conjunction with all that, we're trying to simplify the annual reporting process so the burden is less and the quality of the data is better. Let's go to the next slide. Um, from that, we're also working on an ongoing project that I've reported to the council before about how we implement the divergent measurement regulations that the Water Board adopted in 2016 to implement SB 88, which was a trailer bill in 2015, which challenged us to measure every single diversion in the Delta and provide that data on the, on the overall theory that you can't manage what you don't measure. We've acknowledged through a, a now four year process, through a conscientious program of the Delta Measurement Experimentation Consortium, we finally identified and recognized and acknowledged that there are certain challenges with that uh, measure every diversion that we simply don't have the technology, the capability, and the situation in the Delta where we can overcome those challenges. And so we are taking advantage of a provision in those uh, regulations, which allow us to move to an alternative compliance plan where strict compliance with putting a diversion measurement device on every diversion is just impossible. And so we're using technology again that is rapidly developing, this open ET technology whereby computers are able to take satellite uh, data and provide very high quality, consistent, and most important, readily available on a timely basis, information on what is the evapotranspiration of crops in the Delta. So we're trying to marry those two things, develop an alternative plan of compliance that is dependent on the new and emerging technology. And at our next meeting, the consortium scheduled for July 15th, we're actually moving to uh, adopt and implement a work plan for developing that alternative plan of compliance dependent on open ET, which we anticipate will be available for the uh, 2022 cropping year. So open ET, which is three years through, to, through the development process, a little ahead of its schedule of, for five years, will be delivering, we've already got a, a, a beta testing version of that uh, that's been uh, made available to use tests. One of the most important use tests is in the Delta. So we're uh, deep into that. Let's go to the next uh, slide uh, in terms of our overall work plan. The last time we talked, we were anticipating a decision in Tanaka that's now come down. Uh, it actually reversed the Superior Court decision and um, the, the Third District Court of Appeals said, in order to determine whether a specific property in the Delta or elsewhere, but 
the, the Tanaka decision is in the Delta and the primary uh, applications are in the Delta. So in circumstances where the uh, subdivision that took place, which, which removed a certain parcel from its contiguity with the watercourse, which generally under common law would destroy uh, the riparian right, the court said you've got to look to the intent of the parties at the time that subdivision occurred, and you've got to see if in the four corners of their documents they clearly indicated an intent to retain the riparian parcel, then that riparian, parcel, that riparian right to the interior parcel carries on. But where those documents are not clear, the court gave us guidance on how they should look, and therefore we should look at extrinsic evidence to establish the intent of the parties at the time. The implication here is that there is no bright line rule. Uh, these inquiries are fact specific, but overall the likelihood in my view as Delta Water Raster is that there will be additional riparian claims in the Delta, which are able to take this fact specific inquiry, apply it to their circumstances, and very likely give a higher level of validity and operability to riparian rights within the Delta. And last point I'll make is the third bullet point there, that there has been a petition for review to the Supreme Court filed, and that is uh, still outstanding. Nonetheless, we are moving with the changed law of the case. As I say, this was a reversal of what the law of the case had been based on the Superior Court decision of a couple of years ago. So we're now applying law of the case recognizing that there could be uh, further appeals. Next uh, slide, please. Um, I've, I've talked to the council before about what we're doing to improve Term 91 administration. And this report is timely because the conditions for triggering Term 91, which is a term in more recent licenses granted by the board, basically in all licenses granted since about the middle 60s, Term 91 says when certain triggering conditions are in place, if you've got Term 91 in your license, we'll tell you and you will then have to curtail diversions under that license. So we actually triggered that on June 5th. Let me move ahead to the next slide and I'm gonna come back to that slide in a minute, but let's move ahead to the next slide, which is a blow up of that Term 91 graph. And this is taken right off of the uh, website uh, of the uh, Watermaster and the Division of Water Rights. We update this on a weekly basis every Friday based on latest hydrological and, uh, and operational information. And you can see there that the two conditions, one that the Delta be in balance and two that the state and federal projects are releasing previously stored water in order to maintain water quality in the Delta. When those two things come together, uh, the term 91 is triggered and that's where that red line is that's uh, on June 5th when those two conditions came into effect and term 91 is now in effect. Now, Brandon, if you go back to the last slide then, uh, we uh, uh, developed that uh, graphic to inform people, to let them see kind of on a, on a day up by day, actually week by week basis, how conditions are developing and when Term 91 might be impacted. Now, frankly, it doesn't have a lot of impact on the Delta, primarily because these are relatively junior uh, licenses from the 1960s, and most of the people who hold those licenses in the Delta also have, you know, kind of a belt and suspenders. They've got other more senior water rights that they generally rely on, many of those riparian or pre-1914 rights, which have a very high priority in our system. On the other hand, going through this Term 91 administration, as I reported before, gave us the opportunity to improve coordination among regulators and operators. So our office, the Office of the Delta Water Master, with the Division of Water Rights and with the project operators, we really use this as a way to improve our information sharing so that, for instance, we don't have to make telephone calls and say, are we, uh, are we, uh, in balance, where are you with uh, 
uh, release of stored water. All that information has now been made generally available so that that slide is created by scraping publicly available data sources. And this is one of the things that will be presented at the Data Science Symposium uh, next week because it's an important breakthrough in terms of managing data, making it available to users, and helping people to plan for what's ahead. And therefore, we intend to use this as a template for improving the administration of water rights in the Delta, in other circumstances, and statewide. So Brandon, if you go next slide and then the following slide, because the we've already been through the next slide. And then uh, this, is, this is the final thing. What are we doing in terms of coordination with others? Well, one of the big ongoing things is to really focus in light of uh, the vindication of the Delta plan on promoting the one estuary, one science, in improving our uh, coordination, not only with the uh, uh, CSAMP and the uh, IEP and the uh, Delta Science Plan, uh, the Science Enterprise, uh, but also um, in, in the State Water Board, where the court has indicated that we've got overlapping jurisdiction with uh, the council. And uh, one of the places where the rubber really meets the road is what on the slide I'm still calling uh, climate change vulnerability assessment. And uh, it's now been rebranded as Delta adopts, but uh, uh, both within our office and within the Bay Delta unit of the Division of Water Rights and with our Office of Information Management uh, and Analysis, we're all in on that uh, unified science program. Um, we're continuing to work with the projects, that is the CVP and the SWP, uh, on implementation of one of the aspects of the Water Quality Control Plan, which is the development of a comprehensive operations plan for the projects, working with other users and uh, diverters in the Delta uh, on Southern Delta water quality. And finally, the uh, uh, Fremont Weir Big, Big Notch Project, which is actually physically outside the Delta, but has enormous impacts on the Delta. So uh, we're working on all, all of those things. And I apologize for speaking so quickly, but I talked to Susan earlier, uh, I guess last week, and she warned me that we needed to be crisp and move this stuff uh, along. So I hope I've been crisp and haven't uh, spoken too fast to be uh, uh, understandable. And uh, last slide, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Michael. Yes, you have been crisp and, and I don't think it was too fast. Council members, any questions? Well, thank you, Michael, for the refresher on term 91. And uh, I assume that in addition to reading 900 page index, you've read all the material that was indexed. Every single one of them, Chair. <laughs> Well, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, on to agenda item 11, endorsement of the council's public participation plan. I think Brandon is up. Or Jessica, maybe? I think um, for the sake of time, I'll just uh, turn it over directly to Brandon. Okay. One second while I put up the slides. All right, thank you, uh, Chair Tyen and everyone. Um, we're really excited to be presenting a, a final draft on the um, Council's public participation plan today for your consideration of endorsement. Um, just a quick overview. I'll give a I'll give a quick overview of where we've come from and the timeline on the public participation plan. Um, I'll delve into the details of the comments that we received and how we address them. Um, and then we'll open them up to any questions that you all have. So really quick, just to, to date, to give a quick refresher. So this started all the way back in early 2019. Um, we tried gathering some lessons learned on how the council has interacted with the public in the past, um, whether it's past efforts, best practices from other agencies, um, and as general best practices. 
And we also released a public survey in early 2019 that uh, tried to really grasp how the public um, interprets how we've done outreach in the past, where they suggest we can do better, um, and just get some general feedback. We also did some direct outreach to some community-based organizations. And one example is the um, Delta Protection Advisory Committee, which advises the, which is a, a public group that advises the Delta Protection Commission on Delta issues. Um, and then we also met with some Stockton CPOs as well to get their feedback. Um, you'll remember back in February that I presented on the draft plan at the time and, and got the council's feedback. Um, and at that point, we also released it for a public comment period. Um, the communication strategy that uh, Jessica mentioned earlier in her executive officer's report has also influenced the development of this. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the public comment period that we had went from March through May. We ended up doing two public comment periods, and I'll delve into that in a few minutes. Um, but then we also had a, a in-person roadshow at the time. Um, this was right before um, COVID-19 hit, and then we also had a, a public webinar to receive information and feedback as well. Um, and then this is a quick overview to where we are today. So today um, we have the final draft in front of you for consideration, um, and we're asking for the council's endorsement um, of the strategies in the plan. And just to give a quick overview of what this plan is, so this is uh, the council's always had a, a commitment to outreach. It's what the council's been based on as being a, a public board, uh, a public comment in a lot of what we do. Um, and as I mentioned, it's part of the communication strategy as well. And this document is guidance to the public and to council and staff of what, um, how to engage with the council, what are the ways that um, anyone can provide input on the decisions that the council makes, any of the work products that uh, the council develops, um, and one important thing to note, to note is that one size does not fit all in this. Um, it's really a suite of different options that the council can use for getting public engagement on each project. Each project has, is different. It has different needs, um, different um, opportunities for engagement and what actually can be influenced from engagement. So making sure that those are clear. And a quick overview of the foundational elements that are in this plan. Um, so the first one is uh, making sure that the council communicates how public comments are used. And that goes into also whether they're not used as well and, and rationale why. Um, making sure that we as the council understand the impact of our decisions um, on all affected communities. Making sure there's a clear process to participate in the council's decisions. Uh, having continuous evaluation of how we're doing, whether that's um, just on each project, uh, making sure that we're up to date on best practices um, around the country and the world, really, of how to best engage the public. Um, and then the last one is to make sure that we're evaluating and promoting equity, inclusion, accessibility, and diversity um, in everything the council does in, in outreach. Um, I'm not going to get in, in, in depth on the suite of public involvement, but I'll just give a quick reminder of, of the general strategies that are in it. So first, there's our general public meetings with the council, uh, the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee, and the Delta Independent Science Board, and then just other general public meetings that we do for workshops and other um, other ways we get public involvement in our, in our projects. There's general public comments. There's both at the public meetings, and then we always accept public comments by mail or by email. Um, outreach to community-based organizations is one thing that we're focusing on with this plan and making sure that we're um, reaching out to those organizations that are best suited to reach out to um, communities that we might not um, be able to get out. And there's a science program events, symposia, the Bay Delta Science Conference, other different events that the science program puts on. There's tribal consultation that we do for CEQA and in all other, um, other projects that we that might have. There's outreach to external groups. That's one thing also that we're working on uh, doing more so with this plan. So I mentioned DPAC earlier. That's an example of, of groups in the Delta doing more outreach to regularly and providing updates. And the general public forums that we do, workshops, anything like that um, for, the pro for the public. There's online engagement, whether that's social media through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
um, or any other ways in social media of reaching out to the group. And then there's staff assistance where we make, we always have staff that are available to help the public um, provide the, the input. Can everyone hear me okay? I'll just say, Brandon, when, when you turn your head, it, it, it gets very difficult to hear you, but when you're facing the screen, it's fine. I'll just- Yeah. Okay. Yes, One your second. voice uh, cuts off. All right, I have two screens. So let me move my laptop here to- Sorry about that. Um, so now just, so that's the general suite of public engagement that we have in the public participation plan. Um, but now I just want to go over the public comments that we heard over the last um, couple months while we have the draft plan out for a comment. Um, the first thing that, that was brought up and I think is apparent that when we released this public participation plan um, in March, it was right around the time of COVID-19, and, and which is still ongoing. And so one thing that we were planning on doing once, once we released the draft was to include a section on how the council will make sure that public engagement is still accessible um, when in-person meetings and events is unfeasible. Um, so we added that section, making sure that there's considerations of public safety deadlines and other considerations and when we um, have to change how the public engages. Um, and communication is key. So we're gonna make sure that between the website, uh, our listservs and mailing lists, and other different um, ways of making sure that the public is aware of if the public engagement processes for any project is different, how they're different and how they can still be involved. Um, and I think this meeting is a good example of, of how we've adapted. We've um, changed to a completely remote meeting um, and we still provide, have opportunities for public comment during the meeting. Um, some other different um, comments that we've received as well, just to kind of go over those, there was some comments about making sure that there was a clear point of contact for public engagement. And to address that, we've um, changed the name, actually our the Office of Meeting Services and Special Projects is being renamed to the Office of Public Participation to make sure that it's clear that that's where you go if you wanna engage the council. Um, and also that there's a one central point of contact and it's easy to, to follow, either with the engage email address that we use or the, the phone numbers that we provide for reaching out and getting involved. Um, we also receive feedback to conduct meetings in the Delta and also outside the Delta more often. Um, that is something that the council strives to do regularly. Um, we try to, to have our meetings more than twice a year. Um, and it just, it really depends on the agenda and, and the interest. And that's one thing that's in the public participation plan in general is making sure that the locations for meetings where decisions are made are as accessible as possible to those that might be impacted by those decisions. Um, we also heard to make sure that whenever we're establishing advisory groups, that we reach out to those community-based organizations as well for potential members. Um, so that is something that we've incorporated and we'll be doing whenever we establish an advisory group for our projects. Um, and then lastly is when we start, when we return to um, in-person meetings, ha potentially having a way for the public to still be involved remotely and that is something that the council will be looking into in any way that to participate remotely in the future will be outlined on the meeting notice for those meetings. So those are the general comments that we received during the public comment period. Um, so just to go to what we're asking for today. So we're requesting endorsement um, by the council of the public participation plan. And the next steps after that is uh, if we receive that endorsement is to update the council's web pages to reflect the new strategies, making sure it's clear online how the public can get involved. Um, and then also we're providing a regular update in our annual report of um, how we're doing, how many people have been involved in the process, how many public meetings we've had, um, and general statistics like that to keep us accountable. Um, so yeah, so I'll open it up to any questions and apologies that I was uh, fading in and out there if there's any any questions on anything from the beginning that you need clarification on, please let me know. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Council members, any questions for Brandon? Yes, I have one. Um, you know, I 
do work on infrastructure projects and in and, and there's this whole um discussion going around that you know public outreach for and 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 stakeholder participation is going to change under covid and pa and post covid mm -hmm. and i was uh, i was thinking of maybe we add a page somewhere with some um with some specific suggestions or conceptual suggestions, if you want, on if this situation continues, what are many ways in which we can still reach out to the public and not only just say, oh, social media and Zoom, but say, you know, a little bit more, you know, thinking a little bit more about uh, could we do certain kind of uh, gr smaller group, staggered group participation? Could we uh, do a certain kind of pop-up tents in certain areas where people and, and the stakeholders can come together and, and think of maybe one or two or three um, uh, ways, new ways of, in on top of social media and Zoom, we know all that. Things that it's more, it's a little bit more person to person yet, you know, uh, in compliance with the COVID regulation. I'm thinking that maybe we should add a page on that or start thinking about that just because if this is a more, you know, prolonged period, we might lose touch with our, with our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. well, that's a general mm -hmm. suggestion I have. Yeah, and I think that's, that's one thing that, so we, for the plan in general, we tried to keep it particularly broad. So that way we were, for example, because you're endorsing it today, that way, whenever there's something that might come up in terms of best practices or different changes, it doesn't have to come back to the council every time. So that's one thing that the website, I think, would be a really important resource for and making sure that that can be the most up-to-date, has all those details of how you can get involved directly in the moment. Um, and now it and it's it's much more up to date and clear than a, than a public participation plan could be. Thank you, uh, council members. Any other questions or comments for Brandon? I, um, I think that Maria's suggestion is is very relevant and important, and I, I, I think that we should look at this in terms of a post COVID world. Mm -hmm. Much different than we have now. Even you know, but I'm talking about not about specific t techniques and, and, and methods, but uh, just to conceptually be thinking about that. I think it makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you, Judge. Any other comments, Madam Chair? This is Oscar uh, Brandon. First of all, thank you. I know this is a lot of work. Um, it's it's a living document, obviously, and I appreciate the idea that you've underscored. Uh, your own sort of internal check-in as to how you're doing relative to what you've outlined uh, in, as it relates to public engagement. It's a lot of work. It's 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 almost, um, well, it's a lot of work, I'll just say that. Um, and so I appreciate you done, you, done a, you and staff have done a great job of laying out a series of things that I think can be done um, to help engage the public. I know I was one that pushed on this early in 2019 in large part because I wear different hats and I hear oftentimes folks don't feel engaged. Uh, that's not necessarily a reflection on the work that you're doing. It's just that there's somewhere between them and you, that, or you, I say, the stewardship council, that there's work to be done, and that's always going to be the case. So I think this this is a great document. It's a great starting point for uh, finding ways to engage the, the, the public in, in um, innovative ways. So thank you. Thank you, Casper and Bayes. Uh, so council members, we're running a little long on time and some of our presenters for the following agenda item uh, may have to leave before uh, we actually finish the meeting. Um, so if we are ready to move this item with the understanding that uh, the plan will address Maria's suggestion um, are, are you willing to go forward with with the motion? I so move. Moved by Randy Fiorini. Second. Second by Oscar Villegas. Uh, any public comment? No public comment. Okay, let's start with Judge Damrell on the vote. 
General I. Randy Fiorini. Fiorini I. Mike Gatto. Mike Gatto I. Maria Moranian. Moranian I. Oscar Viegas. Oscar I. And Susan Tatayan I. Uh, the council has endorsed the public participation plan. Hi, Susan. I'm back. Uh, Zingali I. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Chair Tatayan and council members and uh, council member Moranian. And I'll, I'll definitely we'll reach out to you and so, go over some of those strategies to try to implement into the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, on to agenda item 12. Department of Fish and Wildlife Frank's Track Futures Project. Just one second while I move them over. All right, looks like they are both on. And I'll make sure they're unmuted. And then we appreciate the double duty you're doing here of switching so seamlessly from your own presentation to facilitating the others. No problem. All right, looks like we got Brett there. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Brett. Welcome both, Brett and Carl. Thank Good you. to see you. Thank you. Uh, so I'd just like to make a couple comments before we start. Uh, Brett will do the majority of it. Uh, I just want to point out that this is uh, an effort to really look at restoration in a different way uh, and from the perspective of really changing the system and how an area of the Delta works and applying the guidance that came out of the Delta Renewed report uh, that SFEI produced a couple of years ago. Uh, it's not just a project restoring the edge of the Delta uh, and trying to reclaim some of the historic as aspects, but really changing something that has a product of reclamation and then the failure of that reclamation. Uh, the other point that I'd like to make is that, you know, this is a second phase effort. It's an effort to apply the recommendations of the Delta Conservation Framework and truly engage with the lo local community in trying to develop a project that meets multi objectives from ecosystem to economic and recreational and the community's interests in flood protection and the like. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brett. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Brad Milligan from UC Davis. I'm a member of the of the team, um, the consultant team working on this. Um, so, with the slides I'm going to show today, um, if, uh, next slide, please. Um, we gave a webinar, a public webinar, back on June 9th, and um, if you go to the Frank's Track Futures website, you can watch the whole thing. There's a, an hour presentation and an hour Q and A with the public, but. What I'm going to try to do here is just give a very high level overview in about 10 minutes. So if you want more detail on any of that, it's in that presentation or we can you know, see how we answer questions. But um, with that, I'll just start in where we were on June 9th is where you see those arrows right around in the middle. I'm assuming most people on this call are familiar with the structured decision making process and public engagement where you work with a set of stakeholders to really try to set what the objectives are for the project in a very transparent way and then move through an iterative design process to see how you meet those objectives. Um, so that's we're sort of just past that consequence and trade-offs and now working towards a decision of a preferred alternative um, out of what we've been doing for the past year. Um, next slide please. Um, is it advancing for you? It's still on the same slide for me. Mm -hmm. uh, one second. It's not advancing for me either. There we go. There we go. 
So as Carl hinted at, the first round of this, um, the project met water quality and ecological objectives, but uh, there was a lot of pushback by the local community. And so basically this whole round of this planning process has been about seeing if we could make a project that pretty much meets all three of these um, objectives of recreation in the local economy, water quality and ecology, with each of them being on an equal plane. Um, so overall, these are the metrics and objectives of the project for uh, meeting recreation needs and uh, improving recreation in ways we can, um, navigability for boating, the local economy and sustainability, ecology, water supply, levy and flood protection, um, and overall evaluating project cost. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit about, you know, a lot of people were just talking about public engagement. One of the ways we kicked this project off with a public meeting was to ask people to map for themselves, you know, what, what are the uses of the tract and what's important to them. So I'm just going to show a few highlights of that so you can get a sense of it. Next slide, please. This is an online interface where people could actually, you know, mark things up on a, on a map. And this was asking them, you know, where do you recreate in the tract and what do you do at this location? So we had about 350 people fill this in and you can see, you know, boating, canoeing, fishing, hunting, jet skiing, kayaking, kiteboarding, picnicking. Um, this is a state park recreational area. So a lot of recreation that has evolved since the 30s when the uh, open water was created by levee fa failures. Next slide, please. This was asking, how do you boat? in and across the tract. And this was uh, something we knew from the, the feasibility study, the first round was that this is a boating hub, a boating highway, it's how most people get around in the Delta. So boating and navigability was a, a primary concern um, uh, for boaters here for lots of reasons, whether it's where they live, fishing, recreation, et cetera. Next slide, please. In the survey, we also asked progressive, uh, um, uh, projective questions about the design, you know, where could Tidal Marsh best be located? Uh, you can see there's sort of a cluster in the northeast and on Little Frank's tract, and you'll see how this is reflected in the designs. Next slide, please. We also asked people, you know, what, what could you see being improved? We had heard a lot of things about don't touch things, but there was also a lot of things that people didn't like in the tract, such as snags, shallow boating areas, um, the weed problem, you know, the uh, weeds keep getting denser and denser with each drought. And so from this, we knew there were things that people would like improved. There were things they wanted the same. And basically the design process was trying to figure out, could we diversify the tract in certain ways through topographic inventions to, to try to make some of these needs all come together. Next slide, please. So um, basically, we started over when we did this from where the initial uh, proposal had been in the feasibility study. We started broad. We started with six designs plus the no action alternative. And you can see what, how they vary is how um, the green areas, which are mostly all tidal marsh, and how those are arranged to meet these project objectives, um, as well as that no action alternative that we carried all the way through. So I went from this and through the series of public meetings and stakeholder meetings and uh, um, with the advisory committee and a steering committee of all the different uh, public agencies involved. Um, next slide, please. We advanced this down to three alternatives or three concepts plus the no action alternative. Um, we've had these three for quite a while and we've been refining them um, for the last four or five months, modeling them more and more, making tweaks, changing things around. And so what I'll try to do quickly here is take you through all four. Um, next slide, please. So beginning with the no action alternative, um, as things are right now, next slide, please. Uh, we took a projective view on this of, you know, what's important now and how things might change in the future, sort of a scenario approach. And there's lots of things that people really like in the track, such as the bass tournaments. This is a, uh, you know, world-class bass fishery. Um, the hunting that is out there that is managed by uh, um, parks um, and the boating and fishing, that's really important. Um, and then there's things that people don't like as much, such as some of the aquatic veg, the eroding beaches. There isn't really a land base for recreation out here. The degrading Remy uh, levees in front of Bethel Island that protect those marinas and those homes, the boating hazards, and probably least liked is the temporary salinity barrier when that goes in because that uh, changes all kinds of things in negative ways. Um, next slide, please. So that's the no action alternative uh, versus the three design concepts, which entail this uh, importation of or regrading the landscape, basically a cut and fill operation. So 
what you see in here, the areas of green are the proposed marsh areas, the tidal marsh, and you can see the channels in there. The darker green is showing upland areas. And the dashed areas you see that are um, a deeper uh, black color, that is where the material would be pulled from. So it's a cut and fill operation where you would dredge down to as deep as minus 25 feet and stack that material as you dredge it to create these land masses uh, of habitat. And um, so these have been more or less calculated uh, to, to not have to import materials. So it's more or less using material that's there. Uh, the main move you see here is uh, the, the sort of barrier or protection for salinity is the, you know, the land mass and that channel that goes through it that stops the water, the um, salt water that usually just comes straight into the tract and diverts it away. So you have one channel through there. Uh, the white crosses you see on Bethel Island, those are the existing marinas. And what we heard from the community is they don't want more public access on the Bethel Island because it competes with their businesses. So the, the yellow uh, X you see up on Jersey Island is a proposed potential other non-motorized boating area, but otherwise we would be using or employing the uh, access points of the marinas as they are now. Uh, the little yellow dots you see and the, uh, are uh, sort of public day use areas or potential camping areas that are often associated with the beach, which is the orange. Again, the beaches were in high demand because most of them have eroded away. So these would be areas that people can vote to and recreate. And we've done those to sort of cluster them together. Like you see in Little Frank's track, there's one there that's uh, conceived as a non-motorized boating area in there. And this is common to all three designs. Um, and clustering that day use area with the beach. Um, up on landmass B, you see that same mooring area for bigger boats off the larger channel, again, with the beach area. So all of the designs have about four of these features placed in them. Um, down, so Holland Tractor just talked about a little while ago, one of the, pro the proposals here, which was by State Parks, was to create a operations area on that tip so that you know, they manage this property and with these new recreational features, offering them a place to manage that. Um, so that's that one overall. Next slide, please. It's faster to go through the other ones now that you know the layout. So same public access on here, nothing on Bethel other than the existing businesses. Same configuration for Little Frank's tract. And here you can see the main landmass is now moved towards the middle of the tract. So you get these two large bodies of water. Um, same process of stacking those up from the dredged material. So you end up with this really deep pool in front of um, uh, Bethel Island, which people really like because I didn't mention this on the last one, but if you go down below 25 feet, you really reduce the weed problem because they can't take purchase in the darker, deeper water. So you really are opening these areas for, um, for boating. You see this one has two channels through, which made it more popular, uh, you know, to get through um, to the other side. Um, similar, you can see the different features, the four beach areas and mooring areas that have been arranged strategically throughout the tract. Um, public access proposed for non-motorized boating down on that northern tip of Holland Tract, as well as still over by Jersey Island. Um, I wanted to say in here as well that this one and in the last version, obviously the open blinds that are usually used, that are used for hunting now would be reduced by all of these uh, interventions. And so we are also trying to diversify hunting and, re and introduce it into the wetlands themselves, sort of what, uh, like what happens on Sherman Island. Next slide, please. So this is the third one, which pushes the land masses as far to the east as possible. Similar to the last one, there's two navigable routes through those. Um, all those channels I've been showing are 100 meter wide bottom width. Uh, scale's a little deceptive here because this is about 3,000 acres. So they're wide channels that you know fast water boating can occur through. Um, same public access situation on Bethel Island. Um, those little uh, levees you see in front of Bethel, those are the levee fragments, which in all, um, all of these designs would be bolstered to create protection for those local communities. Um, and this one creates the largest single body of water in front of, um, of Bethel Island. So again, these were arrived at through a very iterative process with uh, our advisory committee and steering committee and public input. And so far, the one I showed before this, the central landmass with the landmass in the middle is the preferred concept according to that, that process we've been through. Uh, next slide, please. So common benefits of all the designs. It uh, improved boating access through dredging, channel deepening, and associated reduction in aquatic weeds. Uh, the potential for new recreational features within this recreation area, such as uh, beaches, sheltered coves, and anchorage area, day use areas, kayaking conditions, et cetera. 
improvement to the levee remnants um, and maintaining open water views and marina access at Bethel Island, which was a, a key stakeholder concern. Next slide, please. Uh, creation of large areas of tidal marsh, riparian channel edge, and ecologically valuable features that provide habitat for a variety of species, uh, including sport fish and waterfowl, um, and uh, species of concern. And uh, it's not mentioned here, but I think also in terms of climate adaptation, the way that these marshes will be able to uh, adapt with sea level rise you know, up to a certain rate, unless it gets um, very fast, but this is a more, this will be adaptive to climate change. Um, increased food production to benefit native and sport fish, improved water quality for human use by reducing salinity in the central and south delta, and potential improved water supply reliability by reducing fish entrainment to the south delta. Next slide, please. So again, using the structured decision making process, these are the overall categories and um, we go through this in much more depth in the webinar, but you can see the those same ones I mentioned before. And then we've broken out the construction into construction impacts and total costs. So this is how they rate overall, the no action versus the concept A, B, and C. Uh, since we did this, we have worked on flood protection more and overall from the modeling that's been done, there is no negative effect in terms of flood. There was some concern that some of these land masses might actually lead to flooding problems. Um, so we are closer on having that, that uh, criteria um, advanced as well. Next slide, please. This is just showing an example, a rendering of those navigable channels between the, um, the land masses of the, uh, uh, the wetlands, again with a 100 meter uh, width at the bottom. Next slide, please. Recreation, which was broken down into fishing, motorized boating, non-motorized boating, shoreline recreation, and waterfowl hunting. Uh, so overall, we are showing a sort of a diversification and improvement in those. Um, there definitely would be changes in how um, you know, people boat through there, but trying to optimize that. Next slide, please. These are some renderings showing that, again, a huge demand by the local community to have places where you can actually get out of your boat you know, as a state park and let your kids roam around or having some non-motorized boating areas and these kinds of features that, don't, um, really, that used to exist but not, don't exist anymore. Next slide, please. Just another example of showing these kind of quieter uh, mooring areas where people can drop anchor, you know, with a beach for smaller boats can just pull right up onto those uh, shorelines. Um, next slide, please. And then on water quality, this is broken down into, you know, how uh, it reduces salinity, the emergency drought protection and supply reliability. So you can see that um, all concepts greatly improve on these. Um, you know, they all rated pretty similar in terms of salinity. Um, and then emergency drought protection that with this proposal, um, there'd probably be a much less need or significant reduction in the need for an emergency drought protection barrier, which is, uh, you know, a benefit both to the public agencies, but also to the local community that really uh, do not like the, um, the temporary barrier when it goes in, it's very disruptive. And then um, particle tracking modeling looked at entrainment and found that it significantly reduces entrainment for smelts. Um, uh, it's negligible for salmon, but a high benefit there for smelts. Um, and those bottom graphics are just showing uh, details of that modeling for the three concepts. Next slide, please. Water velocities, this is a key uh, criteria for boating. Um, so what we found, this is the preferred alternative, that middle one, that the peak channel velocities at you know, their greatest extent are around three feet per second, and they'll typically be less than that. So if you look on the left, that's the existing condition. Again, you see that nozzle of you know, water coming in, and that's how the salinity comes into the tract. And more or less what the design does, which you see on the right, is kind of distribute those velocities. So they're all lessened, but distributed more. So you can see in the two channels, you get a, you know, a higher spike and, a, and then up in the northeast corner as well. Um, but this is well within a manageable level for boating. And so a big part of this project was trying to, through an iterative process, coming up with what's the size of these channels that we hit the sweet spot between um, water quality and navigability at the same time. Next slide, please. Uh, broadly, this project started as uh, a couple years ago as a Delta smelt resiliency project and the goals uh, as it's evolved have gotten more broad, uh, looking also at salmon and creating corridors. I forgot to mention this, uh, in the three designs, that northern um, water course along False River is considered as a, as a salmon and a migratory uh, a corridor where there's a lot of riparian um, 
upland areas that we added to that. Um, but also thinking about the sports fishery that are so important to the local economy, the largemouth bass, striped bass, and waterfowl. So through the diversifying the tract, um, we quantified the different types of habitat that would be created um, for them, as well as the reduced um, uh, aquatic weeds. Next slide, please. So this brings us to where we are now. Uh, we have, <laughs> we just, I heard people talking a lot about adjusting to COVID. We had hoped to have an in-person public meeting and we had to adapt and change things around. So it was nice, we'd already asked people to do a survey. We have gone back to that same interface and created one that's much more about the design. So if you go to this link, um, you'll find um, um, the, the three designs plus the no action alternative. And we're asking people to comment on those. You can drop pins and say, you know, in those actual designs when you're looking at them in plan view, what you like, what you don't like, what you might wanna change, what you have questions about. And then we're asking people to rate them overall. Uh, within there, people can look at fly-throughs to really get a sense of the scale, as well as the renderings and some of the images you saw. So uh, we are have this open now. It's going to be open through the end of the month. It's been active for two weeks since we had the webinar, and then we will take those comments in and then sort of uh, move towards a report for the project. Um, how are we doing on time? Yeah. So with that, I'll stop there, and I guess we can uh, take questions if there if there are any. Council members, do you have any questions for Brett? Yes, I do, Chair sure Tatayan. Brett, Same thanks for the ahead. thanks for the update. Um, it certainly looks a lot different than the last presentation that we received with the with the elevation step. Um, a couple of questions. Number one, it appears that the design is going to benefit Mandeville Island, uh, protecting it from wave fetch. Have you done any modeling to, uh, to look at that aspect? Hmm. I don't think we have looked at wave fetch directly. I mean, we know it'll be reduced because you won't have as, you know, clearly you won't have the distances for it to build over the, over the track, but um, that's something to discuss. Yeah, it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been modeled. Well, I agree with you. It mm -hmm. appears mm -hmm. visually that it would be a great benefit, but mm -hmm. uh, um, I think in the first round, we did look at wave fetch and basically, as Brett said, by breaking things up, you reduce that. And then by actually having, you know, just any time you reduce the, the length of which the wind blows across the water, you're dampening that effect. Right. So Carl, the last time you presented, I, one of the takeaways was this is going to be expensive. And I'm curious, what has been the source of funding for the planning and what do you anticipate, uh, where do you anticipate funds coming from for construction if we get that far? So, you know, the current planning has been supported by Prop 84 funds that the department had. The initial phase was general fund provided by the legislature for the uh, Delta Resiliency Strategy or Delta smelt resiliency strategy. So that was the focus. That was why Delta smelt were the focus of the first cut. Uh, so really with completing this, uh, the expectation is that the next step is, is there enough interest within the community, the broad community, whether it's the local uh, stakeholders, uh, water contractors, state agencies to see enough benefit in undertaking a project out there. Uh, it's not gonna be cheap. Uh, it's a major alteration of, of the system. Uh, but if you look at other projects, uh, probably of similar magnitude, whether it's the uh, Lookout Slough project, which is multi-benefit or even the Big Notch, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of, you know, hundred plus for each one of those. Uh, the drop barrier in of itself, I think was about $37 million for a six month installation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think, you know, while it's expensive, we haven't gotten to the rough uh, estimate of costs from the engineers, uh, but they're looking at that. The, 
first time around, I think it was about a quarter of a billion dollars to do this. Uh, and it, you know, we're hoping we can keep it in something similar to that. Uh, but it really is, you know, an effort to, this is what you can do to change the system. And if you're serious about restoration, uh, particularly in places like the Central Delta, that's what it's going to take. Yeah, it's, I congratulate you on the work you've done so far. It's, um, it's certainly necessary. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members? Uh, is there any public comment on this item? No, no public comment. Hopefully they're all filling out the survey. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Brett and Carl, uh, for being with us today and, and the amazing extensive outreach that you're conducting on this project. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to present to the council. Thank you. So on to our next item, preparation for the next council meeting, which will be July 23. Uh, we will be conducting that meeting remotely also. Uh, before we adjourn, is there any public comment on anything not on the agenda? Let me just take a Hello? another quick look. Sorry, I jumped off the screen. <laughs> you print something. Um, no, I don't see any additional public comment on anything else. Great, thank you, Lita. Welcome. Well, council members, I encourage you to read our executive officer's blog. It's an excellent reminder of all the amazing work that this very young 10-year-old agency has completed uh, and it's a really well-written uh, enjoyable to read blog when you when you think about it you know I, the Department of Water Resources uh, was established 1956 the Reclamation Board which is now the Flood Board 1911 Department of Fish and Game now Fish and Wildlife 1951 Department of Food of an Ag 1919 uh, so I think that the council is taking resource management in the Delta to the next level. And now that we have a Delta plan that has been validated, uh, I am excited to move forward into our future years of work together. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.